I'm, I'm actually, um, I think I'm here as a bit of a joke on Noreen's behalf, because I'm here to show you that size does actually matter. <laughs> um, I'm Martin from Club Space. Um, we're an SME um, working out of the Surrey Tech Park, um, at the Technology Centre. We actually started in Northern Ireland. We formed back in 2016 with some other colleagues that came from Newcastle to set up over in Belfast and a, a private funded um, venture. Um, we got two years down the development path and we realised that where they were working on visualisation, we were very much focused on ground processing and the two were not to, uh, <coughs> not to put too fine a point on it, were quite disjointed by way of the way that they were going from a technology development and the funding needs and the timescales to do it. So we left the colouring team alone and we came back to Surrey um, to work on clutch space. So what we do is we concentrate on the ground and we're very focused on um, problems that we see within the industry, particularly on the ground. We, we went into COVID with a demonstrated and a, um, a delivered um, back-end system, but we felt that there were shortcomings in the industry still with regards to the antennas, which I'm sure Matt, Matt can talk to better than I can. So we actually worked with the University of Surrey, it's actually the IC team, the 6G IC team, um, with regards to reviewing the designs that we had to really use the software that we designed to sit behind the antennas to make the most out of it. And we took that technology on the road and we went out to talking to people. We actually ended up on an accelerator with the US Space Force last year, which really opened our eyes to the opportunities of what we can do and what's possible um, by where not only our technology as it stands today, but also where it could go. Um, so we, we're now in quite extensive conversations with AFRL and the US Space Force um, Operations Command with regards to various deliveries of the technology that we started just by looking from um, the first case that we've done. So, as I said, we are experienced, we are from the industry. Um, Vladimir and Abel work in a project at SSTL, I'm from the industry, but I go way back to the early days of On Digital, if you remember, and the, the use of transmission systems, the early days of B Sky B um, on the broadcasting sector. But I've also worked in other industries, so in broadcast, where you're playing with, um, when you move from tape based video to file based video that you'll know and love. So, I worked on early days of iTunes and iPlayer that you now use every day, um, and Netflix whereas Vladimir and Abel have worked on, um, I think they're up at about eight missions each um, with plenty of years of systems engineering, um, particularly Vladimir, who's, who's quite well known in the industry for his capabilities. We do have traction. We tend to work on the basis of commercial only. Um, we've not taken money from ESA. We've not taken money from the UK Space Agency. In fact, one of my very kind friends told me that the, the Swindon Laser Quest have had more funding from the UK Space Agency than we have. Um, but that's a, a deliberate intention. We're not, we're not built on bureaucracy. We're, we're built on delivering results and moving forward. We've always been bootstrapped. We have taken some debt funding, but we've been able to support that with the contracts and the commercial contracts that we've had all along. Um, and we avoid VCs like the plague. I'm more than happy to talk to anyone privately about that um, and my view towards that. But this has allowed us to move the technology on at the rate that we see best fits us. So we did spend four or five years with the technology, with the software back end, before we moved into the antennas because we wanted to make sure the software could cope with what we wanted to do with the antenna developments. Um, we're now at the point where we're starting to come to market with this. So we are talking to all of the ground station providers. Um, and we are talking to the satellite operators as well about the problems that they're finding, particularly within the ground station um, uh, infrastructure that you have at the moment in Cleos. I don't know whether you know them. They are UK-based, but they're kind of a Swiss-Australian <laughs> mutt. They are, um, they're using, they're doing RF signal intelligence where they're receiving signals from the ground across four or five satellites that are flying in close formation, and they then use the correlation or the, the triangulation, I guess, across those signals to give you a very accurate signal. But that means they've got four or five satellites flying in close formation, which means a traditional dish, um, certainly not the 12 meters, but certainly around a four meter dish, can't handle those because they're too close together. So then you need multiple dishes, but I'll come on to that to a second. So we're hitting certain use case points that we're seeing that there's advantages in our technology because of the approach that we take. And that's allowed us to work across the board with both satellite operators, but also with technology providers. So really what, what we, we've done is we said, look, there, there, there is a, an inherent problem with the space industry at the moment. If you're looking at LEO and how satellites move around the world, um, given that 12 minutes of contact time or 22, I think, minutes it was for Telstar back in the day, you've got a restricted contact opportunity. Yes, you could build more ground stations. That would be a way of solving the problem. But you've still only got 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. You could build it up north in the polar regions. Then you might have 14 times 10, which still amounts to not much more than 10% of the mission lifetime where you're actually in control and contact with your satellite. So for us, there's a restriction in that contact, and that leads to other, um, shall we say, to me, unfavorable steps where you're looking as a step from teleoperation through to uh, autonomy is a leap, 
it's a leap of faith that you take in any technical development, but what you're having to do here is actually you have to do it because you don't have an option. Now that's scary for us as people try and do more and more on low earth orbit, more and more activity, more and more close proximity operations, which to us means you need continuous the ability to step in at any point and supervised autonomy, it needs to happen. The other point that we see is whilst you, you look at the dishes that are available, um, they can only handle one satellite at a time. So if you can only handle one satellite, that means for every dish, um, you can probably handle capacity-wise four satellites an hour um, for every pass in LEO. So that means to handle more than four satellites an hour, you need a second dish. So that makes you possibly do eight, but that means that those eight satellites have to come along at exactly the right interval for you to use that dish four times. And that's not the way it works in the industry. Um, so you've immediately got capacity constraints by the way that you have to use a reflector dish. These are very expensive to scale. I mean, Matt touched upon some of the costs that he's had to, to juggle for, for, for the, one, the one modernization, but that's obviously deep space. But in Leo, they're still just as expensive. It's still the cost of a small house, basically, or in, in Surrey, a, a shed. Um, <laughs> so for us, there's a massive cost in building out to meet the demands. Now, if you think the industry was built over the last 50 years, but you've had tens of satellites up there, you're now moving into the tens of thousands of satellites and whatever's going to go beyond that. You can't continue to use the reflector dish model. Some people are looking at satellite to satellite links. Of course, that, that's a solution. But we feel the simplest thing to do is drag this thing down to the ground as soon as possible, which means you need to have more apertures on the ground. Um, and that's just that simple philosophy. And because you've got all of these constraints within the industry, you also have mission limitations on what people are trying to do on orbit that they would like to do. So if you can only do something under supervised autonomy, I think Astroscale put out a paper about LCD where they had to coordinate 16 ground stations from four different suppliers <coughs> for 20 minutes of continuous service. Now that to us, is 20 minutes is no time whatsoever when you're trying to dock. It's no time really to do anything tangible. So for us, again, it limits the, it limit, it limits the, the possibilities of the mission. So again, to us, the analogy is at the moment, uh, there's probably, I'm trying to look around the room, there's quite a few people here probably remember the days of dial-up <coughs> you had to dial up, I'm just going to go onto the internet to get my emails. And the world is very different today where we're always connected. And that's the difference that we're trying to say is really, really needed in the satellite industry at the moment. So really we're saying, unfortunately, we think from an operational <coughs> point of view, the current technology is not delivering to the needs. So, um, Stepping back, we look at first principles, that's how we address every problem. So if you step back and said, okay, so how do you unrestrict the contact? How do you make it limitless? How do you make it inexpensive to scale? And how do you address those limitations? What are the ways that you do that? And one of the ways, if you look to, for instance, the way that the telephone mo cellular uh, mobile phones have moved on, they've gone from one or two towers that are heavy power, heavy duty, to very many smaller. So 5G is, is much about smaller range and then many more of these antennas. And that, that analogy you can apply to <coughs> space, funny enough. And that's what we've done. So size does matter, as I said. Um, so if you imagine the two-story building, again going to back to what I was saying, um, <coughs> and, uh, in this case is a, what, a four meter radome that we've used as an example on there because we're only concentrating on S-band and X-band. Uh, the size, the cost, and the capacity are the three constraints that you've got in using traditional reflector dish. Um, if you're looking at a four meter dish to handle a, an S-band signal for telemetry tracking and control, that's how big it needs to be, really. Um, if you look at each new satellite you have, so when you look at some of the fields that they have in Svalbard, particularly for the OneWeb constellation, where they've literally got 20, 24, I think, of these reflector dishes that are all set out in a big field to handle those, those satellites that they've got. The cost of this, of course, if you know if you're building a house, it's not going to be cheap anyway, let alone all of the uh, infrastructure that needs to go into supporting that, the cost of supporting and operating that on a 24 hour <laughs> by seven basis. And then the capacity, I'd still get back to that, is the fact that this can only handle one satellite <coughs> at a time, um, which to us is just not good enough. So we've come up with a cupcake. Um, uh, the unit on the, the, on the right, as you look, um, it is that small, it is only a meter. Um, so it's purely aimed at um, S band, T, T, and C. So that's the command and control of the satellites in low Earth orbit. But we can handle duplex for up to 20 beams. Um, for receive, it's actually uh, un limited only by processing power that sits behind it. But the way that we've designed these is to stay an entire ground station within an entire, a, a cupcake of a meter in diameter. So the whole plan is to drive it a completely different way and to use the technology that's available, that's readily available, to change how satellites can interact with the ground system. And that's really what we're doing to open up the apertures. 
Um, the technology we've we've had, as I said, the, the software defined back end, so the bit behind the antenna has been in operational use since 2018. Um, we've been developing the antenna really when we hit COVID, that's when we decided to sit down and address the antenna problem. So we've moved that forward. We had a spin project with the University of Surrey, as I mentioned, which we were very happy in moving the whole project forward by way of um, external validation, because this is one of those moments where you all look around and say, well, this is too good to be true kind of thing. So we wanted to get that external validation, which the, you know, Tim and the guys over the, the IC um, have, have really verified what we've been doing is, is the right path and a, a viable and sustainable path. And we then proved it. Um, there's the signals that you can receive there from satellites in orbit using a prototype system, um, which is only a quarter size of what we're going to be using when we come to production. And one of the other benefits, one of the other really green things and things that frustrates me about the space industry is the need to look at the carbon footprint that we leave behind us. And again, we're well below 1% of the carbon footprint of a, a traditional ground station. Um, well below 1%. Um, so all of our hardware is generic. We use recyclable plastics in the radome. So we're a completely different uh, scheme of, of, of looking differently. We are looking to roll out a small network. Um, uh, we're talking to Saxa Board at one end um, and Southampton University. Um, is another one that we're talking to, another candidate, and then also one in the States and maybe in the Middle East as well. Um, so just applications, just go on. So where, where I started with the ground station network is one way of looking at it. One of the other aspects that you've got, if you're putting all of these apertures out there and you're receiving signal from every satellite that's transmitting in your frequency and you're listening to that data, you can actually turn that data into information. Um, so if you've got two, two antenna, or sorry, two or three antennas on the ground and you're receiving that signal from a transmitted satellite, you know exactly where it is. Whether they care or want you to know or not, it's a different matter. And this is something that the Space Force picked up very, very quickly with our capability is if you're putting all of these everywhere, then you can monitor everything in that transmission band passively, which is very attractive from a where are they, what are they doing, and when are they transmitting. So it's more pattern and life observation that we, we've developed. And that's, that to us is a cost free, it's an algorithm on the end of our, our data that we're collecting anyway. The other way of looking at it is we develop a array of arrays. So when you go back to, to, to the problems that Matt's been dealing with, we, we look at it from an array point of view rather than a single receiver. So we, when we look at, say, for instance, deep space, we wouldn't do it the same way as Matt has because we don't have that heritage. So we look at it in a completely different way and we use our technology of many more smaller, trying to achieve the same aim, the same gain, the same results. So we're approaching it in a very, very different way, um, which I won't go into right now. And then there's other derivatives. So other micro round stations moving into different bands is the other way that we're looking at this. There's bespoke needs, whether that's for Beyond Leo, so Mio, Geo, but also GeoX as well is the other one that we're being asked to look at, both on the ground, but also from the satellites as well, because there's a maneuverability advantages that we offer in the way that we can direct the signal as well, which means you don't need to maneuver the spacecraft to get your signal transmitted in the direction you want it to. Um, passive radars, I've touched on that. And then ruggedized, one of the advantages that we've got when we move into S and X band is the advantages of secure communications. For those of you that know, most of the UK and most of NATO is X band for um, transmit and receive. So for us, small rapid eyes stations that have the ability to do S-band and X-band gives them not the only ability to communicate, but also the ability to command and control those that items that are in flight or satellites that are on orbit. Um, so I ask, I, I'm not, I mean, I know it's a free lunch, <laughs> I realise that, um, but our ask is really we're looking for people to partner with us. We're, we're, we're still only three people. Um, we are self-funded, so we're always looking for partners. While we have the IT, sorry, the IP, <coughs> Um, that we own entirely ourselves and we have the talent um, and the drive and the different thinking if you like to take these things forward. What we don't have is a lot of the resources that a lot of the people in this room have which is you know people scale. It should be through the double door. Funding and other opportunities and we're very keen to talk to people and as I said I'm more than happy to elaborate certainly on some of the deep space things certainly Matt I'd love to follow up with you and just talk about some of the things that the AFL have pushed us into because that's where their needs go and they see how we can offer solutions into that area as well. But from a, from a business plan point of view, we're going from S-Fan, we're delivering that now, we're already talking to customers about sending units to them. Um, we'll move into X-Band after that, and then we'll go to S-X-Band, and then we'll look onto the space as well. But we're a small, finite organisation at the moment that's very much sort of like building our own way through these problems as we see them. Um, yeah, so whilst you're here, I'm, as I said, based over in the research park. Um, so we're not far, so I walked here, it took me 20 minutes. Um, a rainy day.
but that's us and clutch. That's where the name comes from. So just before you ask, it's not about the engineering aspects to it. It's more to do with the fact that my son said, I think LeBron had just something, done something pretty good in the last minute of a game the night before, and he said that was really clutch, and it just stuck. Um, and it kind of works really well in the US. <laughs> we all get it. Um, so that's it. 